Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Is it going to be a happy week? I was thinking as I typed out the description for the for the show this morning, you know, it's, it's got to start on a good note, you know, it really sets the tone, doesn't it, Monday? Sets the tone for the rest of the week. So we'll start out on a really happy note, no matter what. Um, and it's going to be a great show today. I have so many things to tell you, but I just want to remind you when we did our coffee night the other night, our cocktail time on Friday, super fun. Um, we were looking at British rag rugs and that whole long tradition of rag rugs, the earliest kinds. And, um, and we touched on this book, which is just fantastic, a Lynn Stein book. We've said this name many times over the course of our, our coffee times. And she is just fantastic as a writer, as in uh, sort of, this is a bit of an anthology or compilation of just rugs over, over the years. So this is what we're going to be digging into today, and it is going to be fantastic. It's good to see you all. Let's see who's here. Busy times. Carol, great to see you. Happy Monday. You're glad to be back on live again. You've been running around quite a bit. I'm not surprised. It's that time of year, isn't it? I'm thinking the same thing. Naomi, remember Naomi at um, uh, Ravensgate Primitives? She has a rug hooking place one town over from me, and she's a buddy of mine. She just posted a picture on Facebook of a big butterball turkey in the uh, refrigerator or freezer or whatever. It's probably the fridge. And she said, uh, you know, this is your this is your reminder. And I thought, oh, my God. Um, I'm excited, though, because I've got this pineapple, wooden pineapple, you know, like a real 70s thing. And maybe you've had the same pineapple, right? It's like wooden, kind of looks like olive wood or something. And it's got all these little holes and all these kind of cross hatching on it. And it's a toothpick tree. So you cut up like meats or cheeses or fruits or whatever and stab them onto the toothpick and stick them into the pineapple, which ends up looking more like a porcupine than a pineapple. And I found this pineapple at an antique store like a year or so ago. Um, and as soon as I saw it, it was one of those great moments because I recognized it from growing up. It was the exact same, maybe not the exact same one, but it was certainly the same model of pineapple, wooden pineapple, that my mom had when we were growing up. And we were always, you know, cutting up the, the fruits and stuff and the meats to put onto this little pineapple tree. So I'm going to be working on that huge project, right? I'm not a cook. I'd like to be, but I'm not. So I wonder if your brains are going along the same kind of lines if you're about to celebrate uh, Thanksgiving in the U.S. And... Um, Lots to think about, isn't it? It's a lot to think about. Linda, good morning. Good to see you. I like those autumn leaves. Those They're a little bit brown and rusty. Lori, great to see you. Hooking at Whispering Hills in Connecticut this Saturday. ST, is that this Saturday? Yep, Saturday. Okay, I'm going to have to think about that. You know, I didn't have it on my calendar because I was supposed to be doing the talk uh, at the Atha Group in um, New Hampshire, but they had a change of venue and it kind of screwed up their timeline. So we're postponing that for a little while and I'm jumping in next available slot to do the same talk, but it means I'm not going to New Hampshire this weekend, which actually feels quite good because yesterday I was in Plymouth, which is almost like a three hour ride. Fantastic. And you know what? Huh, it's like I went by myself, um, which I never do anything by myself. You know, I'm always like with somebody or with kids. And um, I kind of like just put all of the junk in the car. I have a small Kia Soul, back of the car, front seat, you know. And I put on my Pandora with my Bing Crosby station going, the Holiday Channel. And, um, and it was a long ride, but it was so nice. I stopped at Dunkin' Donuts twice. One for a huge coffee, one to use the bathroom, obviously, right? Got some food, got into Plymouth, and what a beautiful Main Street in Plymouth. Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, Plymouth, right? Like the Plymouth. Um, what a beautiful Main Street. I only had time to go to one antique store, a big multi-dealer, and somebody was, some, they had set up everything for Christmas, and we celebrate Christmas, so I'm always very excited when I see that coming all those decorations and all the sound I could hear like sleigh bells every time somebody opened the door it was very nice and somebody was using old baby shoes like the old white leather baby shoes and stuffing them with little bottle brush, brush trees and little vintage figurines um, and it was so charming I bought I bought all of them um, I thought what a vignette that's gonna be and then I started thinking where's my pencil tree because do you remember last year I had a pencil tree right here on my side with all my German glass ornament collection that I didn't dare ever put up where there's kids and animals. 
um, really got me going and I found a beautiful rug, beautiful braided rug that I can use for the book project I'm working on. It was a super inspiration. And I found some braided balls. So have you seen this yet? Just like rug braiding with wool like you're going to make a rug but instead they must be wrapping this wool braid around like a big styrofoam ball or something. They almost look like carpet uh, uh, bowls, you know, balls for bowling. Um, one really big one and one smaller one, different colors. And I thought, ooh, there's a vignette. But also, I would like to figure out how they did that, right? Being the vulture that I am, because I would like to make some um, braided balls too. Don't say that every day. And um, what a nice time and what a nice group it was in Plymouth. I was at Plymouth Harbor Knits. Beautiful workspace upstairs. I think Kara posted some pictures in our group because she was in the class, um, mostly as my buddy, right? She's, she knows she knows how to hook, but it was fun being together uh, upstairs in this big loft area that they have at this beautiful yarn store right in the center on the main street of Plymouth, right opposite like the Mayflower Two and the and the water, the harbor. So pretty. Um, so it was so nice. It was a full class. It was 13 people. Um, and we did we did designing with cookie cutter ornaments, um, you know, like um, not ornaments, cookie cutters. So they were not just Christmas. We had tons of things out, suits of cards, um, super old antique ones, cat, man, like sort of pen Dutch, um, little, you know, buildings, like every kind of symbol. There was probably 100 to 150 cookie cutters out on the table. And then almost every person brought their own cookie cutter because they had something special, you know, that they wanted to use. Um, so it was so nice. So the, the class came with, I made a big bag of wool strips, like nine or 10 colors for each person. And there were some darks and some lights. And then I gave them a second bag that was a bag of like three colors of t-shirt material cut into strips just in case they wanted to try something different. And um, yeah, it was great. It was everybody's set was a little bit different. And we talked a bit about design for the first half hour and did kind of like I drew, uh, you know, on a big page, like, you know, you can break up this looking at a blank canvas of linen, right, is a bit intimidating for some people, uh, for most people. And, you know, I did like, well, you know, you could break it up like this and do this or do a repeat, do like a fair isle sweater and do stacks with a repeated ornament or do an oval in the center with your motif and then these things in the corners. And, you know, out of all the things that I suggested, everybody did something different and everybody just picked up the Sharpie and just did it and then started to work on hooking. And it was so interesting because some people, you know how I always say there are people who are more interested in the technical part and there are people who are more interested in the creative part. And this was, this was one of these classes where I said at the beginning, I'm going to keep an eye out, even though it was a large group, I'm going to keep an eye out and try to stay in tune with which people are more creative and are, are really sort of agonizing over the design part of it and which people are like, here's a Christmas tree or whatever, um, trace it, done, let's go with the hook in. So it was a real mix of both. And it was so interesting um, to just pop around for those hours and, and visit with people and see what they were working on. And everybody did great and made great progress. It was super fun. It really was super fun, very enjoyable. Um, I just remembered, I hope I didn't leave one of my best frames there. Now I'm thinking about it. I can't picture it, but hopefully it's in my car. So that was a lot of fun. Crystal, great to see you. Good morning. I loved your post of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. That looked like a wonderful day. Oh, the garden gnomes are tied down. It's a really windy storm, huh? Oh, man. Those, remember that, what was it, Travelocity that used to do that, that uh, sort of promote, they did an ad campaign that was like the gnome, and it would pop up in different parts of the world, you know, in the traveling gnome kind of thing. So I hope that your gnomes don't do that and end up somewhere completely different. Uh, Sue's good to see you in Kansas. You've got your turkey going and your maple leaf. I'm feeling the same way. Catherine, great to see you in Idaho. Kirsten, great to see you in Vermont. Yeah, uh, definitely, Lori. I'll try to get there on um, Saturday, but if I don't, which to be honest, I probably won't because I am right at the edge of, I'm not going to say a breakdown. I'm just going to say it's been better. Um, trying to keep everything, you know, um, all my levels normal, kind of, <laughs> even if they're low, uh, because they were really high for a long time. But um, I might, t I might take a 
I don't want to say day off because you know I won't take a day off, but I might take a not travel day because that's still like an hour and a half as much as I love to see Donna. Highly recommend going. I highly recommend going if you're able to, to Whispering Hill this coming Saturday. That's that beautiful Aladdin's Cave of a shop in the southeast corner of Connecticut near sort of the Rhode Island line. Uh, Woodstock, Connecticut, beautiful store. Doesn't get any better than that for a raw cooking store. Along those lines, interesting, I was thinking I wasn't going to keep the studio space again because I just get frustrated with the drive. Everything has been slamming down on me like like the Wizard of Oz, house house after house slamming down. And I thought, forget it. I'm just going to get rid of this space. I'm sick of driving. And at the last minute, I decided, no, let's keep this space. So I'm going to be not only keeping this space, but I want to develop the room next to me that is just used as a glorified uh, floor of my closet at home. Um, just a mess. So I'm going to start, sort of fix that up and maybe have two areas that I record coffee time from for different things, different different nights, you know what I mean? So you get a change of scenery too. I think it'll be really stimulating. I need a change. Something needs to break. I need a change. And remember that Agatha Christie saying, a change is as good as a rest. I hope that's true because I definitely don't have time to rest. Lisa, great to see you. You know, Joe, I think he's coming home from Pennsylvania today. Thank you so much for that excellent spreadsheet of places. He sent me so many pictures of rugs in the last couple of days. We were having such good laughs because um, he knows I'm not overly fond of like the sunbonnet suit for myself for collecting. But he found two that I had him get for me um, that I really, that are were absolutely a bargain and were so pretty. And now I'm thinking if I evolve that little space right next door to where my room is here, um, I'll have more wall space so I can put up some more rugs that you can see in the background, which would be so nice, including those new Pennsylvania rugs. Cindy, great to see you in Southern Northern Illinois. Sounds great. Penny, chilly and rainy in South Carolina. You normally have the sun with you. It's a change today, huh? Beverly, good to see you. And Rainy Washington, you're working on quilt blocks while you listen. I love to think about people working while, while you listen. I was thinking about that when I was driving home on Friday night after cocktail night because I noticed it was like I saw a lot of people were on at the same time and there wasn't a lot of commenting. And I was picturing you, a, lo a lot of you who were on, sitting back working while I was running the show. And I thought, isn't that cozy? Isn't that cozy? And I just kept thinking when I looked, because I, I like to keep on top of the comments, but I thought, oh, there's people probably working because they're still there. I thought, what a nice feeling that is. It's a nice way to feel connected. Doreen, great to see you. Gray and chilly in upstate New York, too. Some snow expected later. Okay. It's time. Martha, happy coffee time. The snow is coming today. Oh, man. It is coming. That is so funny. Things are, are a change and joy. Good to see you. Cloudy day, even in Florida with drizzle. Courtney, it's funny how you two sisters are often stacked like a little totem side by side. Heather, great to see you. I'm working on your surprise project. I got a great, I think it's a great idea. I might be wrong. I hope it works. Helene, great to see you. I am good today. I was going to say okay, but I'm better than that. Good to see you. Welcome back. Laura, good to see you. And Donna, good to see you. And Alberta, so glad that you are all there. Good. Elaine, good to see you. And Rita, happy afternoon. Rita, I love looking at your posts on Facebook. I just love all the adventures you get up to. Chrissy, great to see you. Thumbs up, please. Thank you. You always hook during the show, Carol. Ah, oh, that is so nice. It was funny, I got into a bit of a tailspin right before the show, too, because I'm already getting um, people writing in, as far as teaching and saying, what dates can you do next year? And I guess it is time to be projecting forward, but man, it's hard to think about next year when I haven't got my butterball turkey and I don't have that pineapple tree ready to go. It's hard to think about June, July, August, you know? I'm going to be doing a lot of dates, not. And by the way, if you are near Plymouth, because that class sold out fast, I will be doing another class for them in... February. Um, it will be different. We won't be doing the cookie cutter class. But, you know, I really liked the idea of doing part design, part hooking. So I'll think of something neat. I might do something completely different, but it'll be something wonderful no matter what. So something to look forward to. Oh, I put um, the bingo cards are available. I need to put them up in the Facebook group. Friday night coming up, bingo. Food theme, right? Thanksgiving heading into the holidays. Um, we are all going to be loosening our jelly bellies, right? 
my, but my belly's already shaking like a bowl full of jelly, but um, it'll, it'll do so even more. So with that in mind, the, the bingo episode is about food, so hook drugs that feature food. And as usual, Kira put that together. Um, and I know she's not on, but thank you, Kira. Sending lots of love and thanks for that. Very grateful. Um, so that'll be Friday night. So I will put the bingo cards. I'll put the links link to them here. I should have done that already in the description to this video. Um, and I also am aware that the book that we covered last, the rag rug book that we covered last week, right? The Rosemary Allen. I got a lot of emails saying that book was sold out. And I know there's only one copy of it that popped up, I think this morning for like 60 something dollars, which is very high. Um, but you know, that book is, is printed by a small outdoor museum, like a local museum, beautiful, beautiful publication, but limited. So I'm afraid that all of the ones that were available when I started running the show, those have sold out. So we will have to keep our eagle eyes open to help each other find other copies of that book, because I know there's a lot of people who would like to have that. And with all of these books, they're not necessarily in more than one printing and they are finite. So that one for the moment is gone. I put the link to it anyway in this video, just in case more pop up, right? Because it's a work in progress. They come and they go. Um, and I put the second book that we're going to be looking at today. But wait, first we need to look at our, I always forget to do this, swatch set for this month is the food glorious food with all these colors of food. Just whenever I look at this, it makes me want squash with jam cake immediately. Uh, but today we're looking at this swatch here probably not going to get good light. It's it's kind of a, a creamy colored swatch with some overtones of like a clotted cream color. Not even like a yellowy cream, but more lighter than that. Lighter than that, like a, like a butter, you know, like butter pat color. Super, super light. And that one refers to the recipe in this, inspired by this book again. I'm back here in Ford's Second Treasury, favorite, favorite recipes from favorite eating places. And this one came from a place in the Northeast in, well, let me change my glasses so I can read, Vermont. So Kirsten, maybe you're gonna know this one. State Highway 11, Simonsville, Vermont, the Rowles Inn. And this is what the Rowles Inn, I'm hoping it's still there, this pink one here. I would certainly go to the Rowles Inn any day. I hope it's still there, Simonsville. How cute is that? So they had this recipe back in the day, this is a 1950s book, um, for baked Indian pudding, right, which is what that swatch is based on. For the past 42 years, the Rao family has operated this country hotel, which was built as a stagecoach stop in 1820. There's a fireplace in every room. There's a fireplace in every room. Overnight accommodations and vacation facilities. So listen to this. Baked Indian pudding. Do you need one more idea for Thanksgiving on Thursday? Four pints of milk, half a cup of cornmeal, three quarters a cup of Vermont maple syrup. Obviously, we are not barbarians, right? We are not going to go to Stop and Shop to get the Vermont. I mean, if you, I'm joking. If you have access to the Vermont, obviously, it's the best. Vermont maple syrup, half a couple of sugar, half a cup of sugar, two tablespoons of butter, half a tablespoon of salt, one tablespoon of cinnamon, ginger, and nutmeg, and two eggs. It's, it's fairly simple, except the Vermont maple syrup. Uh, Vermont Country Store sells that in their catalog, of course, but that can be crazy prices. Scald one pint of milk and mix with cornmeal. Stir until mixture thickens. Remove from the fire and add maple syrup, sugar, butter, and seasonings. All those teaspoons. Beat eggs well and stir into remaining three pints of cold milk. Add this to hot milk mixture and pour into buttered baking dish. Bake in 250 degrees oven, that's very low, for two, uh, sorry, for three to four hours and serve warm, topped with plain cream or whipped cream. Should make eight portions. So for me, that would make like two portions. But this looks amazing. I'm just thinking as I read, whose job was it in 1952 or whatever it was to drive around the country and, you know, visit all these old inns and negotiate with somebody about taking like some of their best recipes as an advertisement for these books, this series of books. What a dream job that would be. Somebody needs to make some kind of Hallmark movie about, I'm guessing it was a female, but it was probably a group of men, realistically 
whose job this was. It's definitely a Hallmark movie waiting to be made. I shouldn't have said it out loud, right? I don't have time to work on that, though. Um, Nilly Sub sold no, still very much there. Oh, is it still there? Oh, you're kidding. I'm going to fox that page again because you know where I'm going to head next time I'm in Vermont. And you know what? I hope they still have that baked Indian pudding. If they do, I'm going to make a little post about it. I'll make something with that color, wool, and I'll say baked, in, baked Indian pudding from the Rao Inn. How charming is that? Speaking of charming, this is one of the great books of the Rao Cooking Library. This is another one that's going to be, disclaimer, it's going to be tricky to get, right? So it's on Amazon. It's a British book. You could also check, um, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, check other places. Check a book, check eBay, check, I would say check Etsy. That's probably not there. Um, you know, you can go into Google and check the name of this book, which is Rug Ra Rag Rug Creations by Lynn Stein, right? Um, and then hit the shopping tab, and hopefully it will show you places where this book is currently available. So it's another one that's at Bloomberry Press, right? Another one that could be tricky to get, but God, is it worth it if you can get it? So I hinted at coffee time yesterday. Uh, sorry, yesterday. Oh, Robin, I'm glad you're there. Dream job, right, Courtney? Dream job. Oh, man. Now, now I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to stop. But now I'm thinking with these Hallmark movies and these kinds of plots, it's like, you know, while you're driving around in the 1950s searching for old B&Bs and inns and these chic motor courts that were chic at the time, right, brand new, uh, and asking people, negotiating for these great recipes, somebody has either, number one, got to ask you to like plan and host some kind of winter festival or take over like a defunct or um, um, B and B right or restaurant that the bank is about to foreclose on and certainly there's got to be like some man in the works uh, who is about to descend and you know change your life kind of thing formula but such a nice formula too dream job so rag rag creations an exploration of color and surface I hinted on uh, cocktail night, there are a lot of non-traditional materials represented in this book. What a lot of fun. You know, I never, I, I never think it's a good idea to go out of your way to add bling or non-traditional materials. But if you are working on something, like in Plymouth yesterday, one of the ladies was working on, um, she took a bunch of trees. We had a ton. Between the ones that I brought and the ones that other people brought, we had a ton of evergreen shaped cookie cutters. And she took, I mean, she didn't take them all. She used them all and traced them and then put them back in the middle for other people. She, she used a lot of them to make a bit of a little staggered forest low in her big square composition. And then she said, you know, I'm, uh, I want to do something busy in the sky. And I said, like a Van Gogh sky maybe? And she said, yes. And she said, I'd like to um, do something different with material in the sky. And I thought about it for a little while and I thought, you know what? A couple of things could work here with all those little cookie cutter trees at the bottom. What a great idea for a composition. You should, you should get on the bandwagon with this too if this sounds good. I said, what about in the sky? Because the sky was like two thirds of this sort of square composition and the trees, there was a lot of them, but they were down in the bottom and she had them so nice in browns and greens. Um, I said, what about hooking the sky then, for example, in denim, right? Because she wanted something different. I thought, let's not, let's not say garbage bags or something that might really put her off. Um, and she said, oh, oh my word, you know, that, I don't think that's exactly what she said. She was a firecracker. Um, she said, I have a collection of um, jeans I was just about to get rid of that have holes and stuff, and I just don't like them anymore, and all different colors. And she said, that would be perfect. Night sky with all these swirls. And, and then I said, another idea, um, because my sister, for my daughter Jocelyn, was just, she was bouncing some Christmas ideas um, off me for Jocelyn. She said, what would Jocelyn say about like a little necklace with a pearl, or in Joss's case, her birthstone is opal, constellation. And you know these, um, I'm not one for astrology, I have to say, but when you see these little constellation things done as jewelry, it's just like a sequence of stars, isn't it? It's just a little like doot, 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 like almost like Morse code or something. 
very, or braille, right, very meaningless unless you know what you're looking at. And for her, it was like the Libra constellation for Joss. So I said to this woman at the class, you know, maybe do denim in the sky. And then instead of doing a big moon, which can be very overpowering and very Van Gogh, maybe think about doing the constellation of your birth sign, de, 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 just little flashes, little pops in the sky. Um, or somebody that you're making it for, or a child or grandchild. And then I thought, pat myself on the back right there. I don't do that very often lately. Because um, I thought that was a great idea. I thought, that's got some mileage, doesn't it? Hooking a little secret constellation in the sky, like a little like a little um, secret message. You know, signing it in, in a very um, subtle way like that. So charming. So charming. Not overt, not over the top, not in your face. Just really subtle. I thought that was a great idea. So she was off and running with that. Um, but this book is going to be much more focused on more overt, not subtle stuff. Oh, do you have this, Helene? This is a great, great book. This is one it's good to already have in the library because I'm afraid there's going to be like a land rush uh, for this one like there was for the last. But can you see all these amazing plasticky tin things in here? And those things that look like pom-poms, those are scrubby sponges, right? Scrubby sponges and this is the whole sponge. Right, kind of probably cut in half to make it a bit flatter and then attached onto the backing. This is like all, I think, uh, garbage bag stuff. Uh, maybe colored balloons, candy wrappers in here, metallics. Right, lots going on. And this could also be, you know, besides those scrubby um, sponges and cloths that you can get, that you can buy, you know, the, the craft store, like the big box craft store sells that material, that scrubby material as yarn that you can crochet, um, washcloths or stuff for the sink, you know, to wash up dishes. So it could be those materials too. It could be a lot of things. But this book is laden with um, really interesting alternate ideas. On Friday, we talked about well dressing. Remember that in England, that very sort of rural tradition of dressing wells, like in the ground. Um, with um, and springs with flowers collections of flowers that look like this and that's one of the inspirations of this author Lynn Stein that made her want to get interested in um, hooking and and rag rugs Rita says mylar balloons I keep everyone I get for a rug absolutely the mylar balloons are great I was hooking with the candy wrappers because I liked these particular colors of this particular brand but the my mylar balloons make a lot more sense because you get much more surface area and much longer strips to play with so fun right fun choices and you know if you're ever kind of stuck with one of these alternate materials and you're having trouble getting it to sit nice as a loop in your backing Remember the whole idea of using a carrier, meaning putting a strip of something very odd, a very odd material, onto, for example, a wool strip, right? And the wool strip is the carrier, and you hook them through together. Because sometimes something like a wrapper or a balloon doesn't have the body, the integrity, the structure to give you a nice big fat loop on top if that's what you're going for. So sometimes it's nice to to pull it through, let it ride through on a carrier so that it has a little bit of body underneath if you're really struggling with one of these non-traditional materials. Um, and I think we looked at, yeah, we looked at the totem. So let's look at some new stuff. I left off saying she does a nice history, a nice um, general history. It's, it's absolutely s suffice, right? It's sufficient for what we need. And then she gets into some other interesting things because remember that the British uh, rag rug, particularly rug hooking history, runs parallel to the North American but very different names and very different players. So for example, she's showing us two rugs by Margaret Warwick and I know we've covered that on a cocktail night um, months and months ago at least. So Margaret Warwick was uh, Winifred Nichols, Nick Nicholson's, we're going to get to her again, again in a minute because she's another person we've talked about. Um, these are old names that might be ringing a bell. Next Door Neighbor, and the work features one of Ben Nicholson's. Ben was the son, if you remember, who started his own company. Hold on that thought. But Margaret Warwick um, lived at the beginning of the 20th century, and she did lots of very sort of folky, old-time patterns. And her neighbor also became a rug hooker. We're going to, that's a to be continued. Um, but this is one of Margaret's pieces, with the little hearth going and the two cats. 
So it's 19, I think it's 1923, this piece. It, it looks um, maybe older than it is. It's a primitive style, right? She's working in a very traditional folk style. Absolutely beautiful. And then she shows us this, which is one of Winifred Nicholson's um, pieces. And Winifred, they lived in Cumberland, right, this, this group of people. So Margaret, uh, Winifred was the next door neighbor, and her son was Ben. And Ben, they went on to have a hooking company. And Ben went on to, let me see if it says it here, I need a memory jog. Um, he developed a company that became quite well known in England can't think of it and it's not jumping out of the page what was it can anybody help me door to otterburn mill oh maybe it'll pop up later he he started a very famous um, hooking company like in the 70s and they'd had about a hundred designs but they were uh, prolific and a lot of people bought those designs and the brand became quite well known in the UK um, but we've talked about it at least a couple of times, so maybe it'll ring a bell. We'll see what we get. But in any case, this piece here, I absolutely love this piece. This is a Winifred Nicholson piece I'm about to show you of a peacock, and it's actually inspired, it's so odd and different, it's actually inspired by the city of Ravenna, or Ravenna. Um, it, it's like a, Ravenna was like a um, Roman Empire city, like one of these beautiful mosaic cities, 5th century. And so this is based on um, a Roman mosaic. And she's based the colors, I think, on it too. Bring it into focus here. But you can see um, it's based on a very old work of our Roman Empire, right? So very different, because we've done a lot on the show talking about pulling from history, pulling from cave paintings, pulling from um, you know, the master's paintings, um, pulling from even older places, murals, mosaics. Um, so interesting, interesting that that would pop up. A beautiful, um, Ravina is really well known as like the central nervous system for Byzantine mosaics. So if that's a side interest of yours, that would obviously tie very well to hooking and punching. Um, that would be a place to go and to be inspired. So in this chapter, it's a slightly different history than what we're used to reading in our local kind of books. But she's got some exquisite rugs here. Like she's got a George Washington rug, circa 1880, hooked in wool and jersey, wool jersey, right? Because of course they, they had jersey. They had the ability to do jersey. They knit, right? Um, but wool jersey. So people would have wool jersey for like their, their leggings, which were their pants, and things they would wear under their pants. Layers and layers of wool in those days. And some of that wool was used to make this amazing George Washington piece. There's the cherry tree, right? Down at the bottom, and that probably is Mount Vernon on the side. Beautiful, huh? Just some nice pieces in here. She sourced some pieces I have never seen before. Um, and that is always a gift. And then she talks about Grenfell. She talks about Elizabeth Lafour. Um, she gets into stuff that's quite modern. I'm going to do one more little bit, and then I'll break um, and save the rest for tomorrow. The chapter where she talks about materials and equipment, as you can imagine, is pretty exciting. Because, again, I say this all the time. And it's like, it's like uh, um, I'm sort of belaboring the point, but it's an important point. The British have historically and continue to be, like the Canadians, so much more wild and free with their material choices. And again, I think it's partly because there are not, and there have not been rug hooking stores over there, like in the US there have been, uh, petering out for decades, but still present. And they really don't have that at all. And as a result, they are very used to finding stuff, find, you know, just going out and finding something and cutting it up. They're, they're quite content doing that, not having to order something kitted or order tons of wool from a place like a mill, right? Um, and, and, and spending a lot of money and, and having a lot left over, they just don't do that. They're much better at foraging than we are in general in the U.S. So in this whole chapter, she's going to talk about crazy and odd things that you might use to both hook prod, braid, however you make your traditional rugs to use for that purpose, but also bling and things that you might add, decorative things that you might add to embellish at the, at the end. And she talks about backing cloths and frames, and they will do frames differently over there too. They, for the same reason, I'm guessing, 
do not agonize about all of these store-bought things that can become super expensive, right? Totally prohibitive for some people. They just don't work like that. And you can see this is the author, this is Lynn, working on a frame exactly like the frames that we were seeing when we looked at Rosemary Allen's book last week in the miners' cottages in the 1890s, right? Just this kind of stretched out wooden homemade frame that's propped up over a couple pieces of furniture. You like the cat's petty, of course. Of course. That's funny. So, yeah, there's still, she's still using um, the same, almost the, it looks like the exact same kind of prototype that we saw in Miners, Miners Cottages in um, the County Durham book that we were looking at last week. You know, and then she's going to talk about hooks, prodders, and cutting tools. And they're showing us, again, beautiful pictures like this. These are, I think, all for Prodi. Um, just different tools. A lot of makeshift tools. They're not going to get crazy about cutters either. Uh, so for materials, she's showing us these kinds of things. I'll scroll down. Frames, clamps. She's got her frame pegged out, if you can see. So she's got some adjustable elements to it. Uh, this frame here, right, there's just this plain frame around these little um, tools. I'm going to comment on that in a minute because that's going to be important. Um, trying to focus you on different things here. But you can see for materials, very different. They haven't got that, you know, beeline cutter, um, and they haven't got those expensive frames going. One of the things that came up in class, class in Plymouth is, um, what does Rita say? I have some red lame. I'm dying to use. Maybe I'll make ruby slippers. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, in class, you know, it came up, the thing about frames, and, and everybody, I think, but Kira was a beginner who was in the class, and it was kind of like, you know, I just don't feel right about saying to people, if they're very, very determined, I'll say, check Etsy, right? There's going to be a lot of frames on Etsy. That's a good place to start if you don't have a rug hooking store. Uh, which they don't immediately have. So having said that, I, th I, I followed up on that by saying, listen, if you want a quick frame, you just go to Michael's or Joann's, you get a canvas, right? Like a pre-stretched canvas, they're super dead cheap, right? And you cut the canvas off and you put your backing material on and, and hammer it in with thumbtacks or a staple gun. You just stretch it over it doesn't have a bottom, right? It doesn't have a bottom. So you lean it up against the edge of the table or something, and your bottom hand, you know, your non-dominant hand goes under and does its part feeding up the strips or the wool while you hook or punch. And it will work just fine, right? It'll work exactly the same way as Lynn is working between these two tables on her exact same frame but just larger. So there's no reason in the world why you can't go back to doing those old things. It is very nice to have the new equipment. It is so nice. If you want it, you can afford it. It doesn't make you feel sick to spend the money on it, you know, in terms of like um, feeling like you spent too much. Then you should, you know. It's nice to have nice things. But you don't have to have those things, particularly if you're a beginner. There are so many ways that you can get around doing all of this crazy spending, just popping, popping the canvas off a canvas and pinning your thing on there with thumbtacks. Why not? All it needs to be is stretched, right? So funny how in these books, these British books on rag rugs, um, when they're talking about tools and equipment, this is the sentiment. They are, this is exactly what they do. Stretcher bars are cheap too, absolutely. Needlepoint frames, same thing, right? You just have to, just have to secure your backing. Make sure it's secure and tight. Hello, Sharon. So, you know, I just, I love reading these British books because it shows them, for example, even somebody like Lynn, who's very prolific and is very well known in the field, she's cutting up, oh, this looks like a sweater or a sweatshirt with scissors, and, you know, cutting up something else over here with scissors, and then over here she's she's got a, just a frame like we were just talking about. You can see she's wrapping Hessian, which is our burlap, around it and hitting it with a staple gun. Um, Kirsten says, I have some old frames rattling around in the basement. I've been wanting a larger frame. Yeah, absolutely do that. It is going to work as good as anything. I'm just going to say it. I love my frames. I have tons of frames. It's nice. I love the combs, the, you know, the carpet strips. It's nice to have that real tough 
whole good stretch on the fabric. But again, if you're a beginner, you might want to try something like this because you might turn out to be Claire Murray. And Claire Murray has never even used a frame. She works on her lap, right? So it'd be awful to be a beginner and spend a ton of money on supplies that you end up, it's not even your preference to use, right? So she also talks about transferring designs. And I'm going to skip over that just because I am so... Um, I am so in love with the fiber tape. You know that. I have lots of videos using fiber tape. I think it's the cheapest, quickest, and best way to do transferring. But this book will tell you some other ways that are a little more dated, right? Um, just a little bit. So that's, that's always up to you how you want to do stuff like that. But she then starts to talk about, very specifically about hooking. These are the techniques that are represented in this book. I'll go over them and then I'm going to log off for the day. Sharon says, I'm new to rug hooking. It's been a dream of mine to make my own area rug for the living room. Fantastic. Well, Sharon, make sure you let us know if you have specific questions because we can help you as you go. Um, what a great project and what an easy thing to do once you get going. It's just starting something is the thing, isn't it? And that came up too with the class this weekend in Plymouth. It was like, you know, I, I gave everybody the backing material, the materials, a hook, a Sharpie, and a little pair of snippers, right? And it was like everybody just sat and, wait and looked at the blank canvas for a while thinking, what will I do? And then they started to fool around and all the containers, the cookie cutters. And then it was like once one person just traced something and got going, the person next to them did it too. Then it was like wildfire. Everybody's just tracing. And it was that moment of like, it's just good to get going, right? So I, I started by saying, when everybody was kind of hesitating and overthinking, and I'm guilty of that too, I said, why don't we just take the Sharpie and just draw our very straight, sort of flush, perfectly squared lines around the edge to create the inner space. And as soon as the Sharpies touched that backing material, it was like the, the seal came off, right? It was like, now that I've made a dot on my fabric, let the project begin, let the games begin. And that's just how it happened. So sometimes it's just just getting started, getting that first loop or getting that first line of decoration, your pattern going. It takes one little thing. Rita says, carpet tack strips on a wood frame, you can get as tight as a drum. That's true. That's how I learned from A.B. Oxford. Yeah, you can get the carpet strips super tight. Some people don't have those carpet strips or they're doing more punching and they're worried about that and they're not wanting to fool with that. I always forget the name of that thick saran wrap stuff. What's that stuff called? Something in seal, right? Peel and seal. Um, so some people will always prefer not to use the copper st uh, carpet strips. I love them too. Uh, but there's ways around it if you don't have access or, you know, you're not going to buy a frame right out of the gate. There's ways around that, too. Um, the other thing is a quilt hoop. You know, a quilt hoop will work great, too, whether you're punching or hooking. I cannot say enough for particularly large quilt hoops and the big box craft stores still stock those, right? Also, the PVC piping. We should do a whole episode on the different kinds of frames that one can make, build, find, buy, right? Press and seal. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Sharon said, Sharon. Yeah, Sharon, uh, Kirsten made a great note. The Facebook group is so good. Our, if you're on Facebook, uh, people constantly asking questions and um, so many people answering questions so thoroughly and helpfully. Um, it's a great place to start when you're starting projects because you can get any information you want. What a nice group of people are on there all the time. So the techniques that are covered in this book are hooking, obviously, and she's showing you hooking here. Yeah, we, most of us know what hooking looks like. Um, prodding, right? We talk about prodding more and more, and I do love prodding. Prodding is when you're working fr usually from the back, right, as if you're doing punch, and instead of pulling up, you're pushing through. So pushing through, so this is the back, and then this is what it looks like on the front. She's pushing that through, and she gets all these little guys in the front. And prodding traditionally is not done shaped like we often do. It's just done as little rectangles, right? A bit of confetti bling. And she's showing locker hooking. She's showing fleece and yarn sculpting. This is something I never talk about. Maybe that's something for the future, but this is something I don't know anything about, and I would love to learn. So she's obviously pulling wool through, and then she's sculpting it with... Um, scissors, giving a small description of each one, right, in one photo. So it's it's like a sampler. If you would like to return to that, and it's interesting to think about pursuing that, this is a great book to say, I like the look of that. Let me see what else I can find out on the internet, right? And this one, too, chain hooking. This is one I hardly ever talk about, too, but this is very easy and fun. 
chain hooking, just showing you how to do that. That's a nice kind of combo, kind of crochet and um, hooking put together. She's also showing needle felting, which we do talk about, particularly on the Nesa Russo episodes that we did. Um, needle felting, um, um, wrapping, wrapping wire, right? So that would be like sitting on the surface. That's a bling element, so that doesn't exactly fit into this list, but wrapping wire is a bigger thing in the UK. And braiding, of course. Braiding has to be in there. Um, yeah, and she talks about uh, making little samplers, doing embellishments. Let's come back to that tomorrow because she's really, even in this one chapter on materials, she's really got some cuckoo stuff going on. Uh, yeah, let's, let's look back tomorrow. I don't want to race too far ahead because it's too good to squander. So let me see. Any new comments? Yep, absolutely. Come, come on into the group, Sharon. It'd be great to have you. We've been getting so many new people in the group, right, Kirsten? And everybody is so nice. Everybody is so nice. So grateful to have so many nice people involved. Um, I think that's it for today. There's a bunch of other things I want to tell you, but there's no need. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow, um, Tuesday. Think about what's happening Tuesday. I'm so skewered right now until I get like a bit more centered. I'm just flying around like a dervish a little bit. But um, today was Jossie's picture day. I hope that went well. We had a terrible incident this morning where, you know, she just got her ear pierced, singular, and she's still working up the nerve months later to get the second one pierced. And I was busy this weekend. I was away. I was busy. I was crazy. Um, and somehow her dad did not put the earring back in her ear for like four days and the hole started to close. So she went nuts this morning because it hurt to put her little earring through and she wanted to wear her one earring for picture day today. So it was just an awful way to start the day with like, you know, something emotional like her crying and being upset and she looked so pretty with her hair all done and she had her clothes just right and she had jewelry on. She even put a little bit of makeup on, a very little bit. And then she started crying about the ear. It's just an awful way to start the day, you know. But hopefully tomorrow will be better. I will be here with you regardless. No matter what kicks up tomorrow, what kind of an S storm starts raging, I will be here. And we will do more of the Lynn Stein book together. And I will be here again with you on uh, Wednesday. And again, be looking out on the Facebook group. And in this video, I'm going to post the info for bingo cards for rug hooking bingo this coming Friday night. I, I can just feel that this is the week that you are a winner and we will add in some mini games for the first time too. That'll be super, super fun. Also be looking out this afternoon. I finally got the die class ready. It's going to be a pre-recorded die class that'll be available starting December 1st, pre-recorded and you're able to choose between, it's going to be um, 10 silk stockings, sorry, 10 nylon stockings, Grenfell style hooking, right? It, the class is called And the Stockings Were Hung by the Jimny with Care. Um, Grenfell style hooking. So you're getting 10 stockings, 10 dye colors, Synthropol, twine, uh, citric acid, gloves, everything that you need to um, squirt bottles, every uh, little containers of powder, right? 10 different dye colors, everything you need to dye those nylon stockings and then you cut them up with your scissors and get going with hooking them. You won't believe how beautifully they hook. And I added a color palette, so there'll be four color palettes to choose from. I think one of them is called, what's that Willie Nelson song? Um, Pretty Papers. I think I called it, I think I called it Wrapping Paper or something. It's like Christmas colors. C Christmas Wrapping Papers or something like that. Winter Wonderland, which is more blues, grays, greens, like outdoor colors. Um, country Squire, and I was thinking like dressing up for the holidays, like cranberry colors, um, navies, traditional, traditional colors again, browns, that kind of thing. And then I added one more, I think I called it New Year's Eve or New Year's Gala, and that's an all brights, right? So you can choose which, which um, palette you want, and I'll send you the whole kit, and then you'll be able to watch that video forever however many times you want to watch it, to do that dyeing of those nylon stockings when you have more time. And I'll also make it a possibility to buy, for example, lots of 10 nylon stockings and not the dyes in this stuff. So I'll make both of those things available after this class. So I'll be looking out for that. I know, Linda. Oh, man. The book is called Rag Rug Creations by Lynn Stein. And if you're feeling it already because you love this sort of non-traditional look and the non-traditional materials, I would get on the computer now because the one from last week, like I said, 
people were lamenting over the weekend. I just got email after email. Where else can you find it? And I just don't know the answers to those questions. It's I check the same places you do, uh, and I don't have any extras. So if you're feeling it, I would get in there and get it now. No pressure. I don't get anything out of it. But if you if you are afraid that you're going to cry yourself to sleep if they all sell out, I would get in there and do it now. Remember, Abe Books 2, A-B-E. I don't know if it's there, but that's such a good one. Hey, I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day. And we will return to our British Rag Rugs tomorrow. Um, and I'll think of everything I meant to say that I forgot to say this time in the morning. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thumbs up. Oh, okay. Abe's book has it for $20.76. That sounds right. That's a very fair price for an older book that's limited.